Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the exhibition at the University of Bath, the, in the Edge, at the Andrew Brownsell Gallery, of Richard Smith's Kites. Um, it's opening on the 28th of September and runs until, I think, the 13th of December, when the university closes for Christmas. Um, it's a perfect show for this space, um, this wonderful high white cube gallery. Um, it is perfectly designed for these huge abstract paintings. Um, and I should say from the outset that the, one of the reasons for doing this show now is that there's a new book coming out on, on Smith, um, published in October by um, the Francis Bacon Estate and Thames and Hudson. Um, and um, I uh, wrote the introduction to that book, um, which is quite a, it's about, it's an extensive introduction. Um, and uh, I could share that text with you all. Um, I could give it to Spencer, um, or indeed, possibly if I get one, a PDF of the book itself, so you can see the whole of Smith's career and how these works um, fit into that longer story. Um, so the works that are here, first of all, um, are from a series of paintings that Smith made from, I think, 1974, 75, in through to the early 80s, called Kites. Um, and he called them kites because they're made a bit like kites. Um, one of the characteristics of Smith's uh, work through the 60s and 70s was the way he pushed the boundaries of what painting might be. Um, I think, you know, he was always committedly and explicitly a painter as opposed to a sculptor, but he made the paintings in different ways, sort of three-dimensional, to see how far I think you could extend the idea of what a painting is before it becomes something else. Um, and so that's the idea behind these um, kites. Um, most of the kites are um, multiple canvases hung on the wall in layers. And we'll, I guess we'll go around the room in a bit and look at individual works in a minute. Um, but he did make a number of environmental pieces. And the centerpiece of this show is the shuttle, the huge blue piece behind me from 1975. Um, he made, that year he made two enormous works, The Shuttle and Yellow Pages, which is very similar, but yellow. Um, and that was shown, the Yellow Pages was shown in Venezuela and stayed there. Uh, the Shuttle was shown at Smith's retrospective at the Tate in 1975. And I think this is the first time it's been shown in the UK since then. It has been shown abroad once or twice in between in the last you know, 45, 50 years. Um, so it's a very exciting opportunity um, to do this. Um, to give a bit of background, um, Richard Smith was born in Lechworth in the 1930s. He um, did national service in the early 50s and then went to the Royal College of Art. Um, he was a sort of, um, he was of the generation who graduated from the Royal College shortly before um, people like David Hockney um, and his contemporaries started. Um, so he was there with uh, Peter Blake, for example, um, and Joe Tilson, and all three of those um, spent time uh, living in this part of the world, uh, which is another reason for this show. These works, I think most of them, were made um, near Chippenham, uh, where um, Smith lived in the 70s um, in a village called East Titherton, which is just the other side of Chippenham. And there was a little kind of um, group of artists around Bath, Chippenham, at that time, Howard Hodgkin lived just outside Castle Coombe. Robin Denny, who was a great friend, you know, Smith's closest friend from the Royal College onwards, lived in um, Whitcomb Crescent in Bath, and Peter Blake lived in Wellow, um, as people may know. So, um, yeah, there was this sort of group of 60s artists who then moved to North Wiltshire, a Bath, in the um, 70s. Um, so, as I was saying, Smith studied at the Royal College in the, in the 1950s, um, and was recognized as a sort of star um, pupil. He won the H Harkness Fellowship, which gave him uh, two years in New York. And really, he was the first British artist to fully engage and spend that sort of um, time in New York, just at that moment when you know, American painting um, in, in the shape of Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko and others was really taking off internationally. So he had that sort of first-hand experience. And I think that was crucial in sort of giving him a sense of ambition. So even from that really early start, he was making enormous kind of eight-foot um, or bigger canvases. Um, 
he was always an abstract painter, but the, one of the first kind of big breakthroughs he had um, in New York was that he started making abstract paintings where the forms and the ideas were inspired by popular culture. And for that reason, he's been seen as one of the fathers of pop art and a great influence on the next generation, the Hockney generation of artists who, who followed him at the Royal College of Art in London. Um, so he was making huge canvases in New York based on corporate logos, like sort of bank logos, um, also sort of packaging, um, and also kind of more, um, less visual ideas. So he made one painting, I can't remember what it's called, that was inspired by um, the, um, not the Andrew sisters, um, but one, a, a sort of you know, contemporary pop group. Um, another was inspired by a photograph of Marilyn Monroe on the cover of Parry Match, I think. Um, so he sort of took, you know, the, the abstract painting in the 1950s was very earnest. In Britain, it was very dominated by ideas of landscape and nature. The artists who were in St. Ives, like Patrick Heron, Peter Lanyon, um, were, were making abstract paintings, but, you know, inspired by the weather and by the sea and the landscape. In America, um, artists like Mark Rothko were, you know, really motivated by kind of ideas of, you know, spiritual ideas and, high, you know, very high brow ideas. Um, whereas Smith pioneered this idea of an, that an art could engage with the everyday life that he enjoyed. Um, and that was, you know, rock and roll, pop music. You know, he was of the generation who started wearing, you know, um, narrow bottom trousers and denim and things. So um, bringing together kind of high art and, you know, youth culture, if you like. Um, and he was amazingly um, prodigious, um, uh, having major exhibitions at the White Chapel when he was about 30, and then his retrospective at the Tate in 1975 when he was only just 40. Um, so when he came back to London in the um, early 60s, he started making a series of paintings that were kind of based on packaging, and in particular cigarette packaging, which of course was the sort of, at that time, the sort of sexiest um, form of packaging. All the adverts of, for cigarettes were always sort of um, uh, aspirational. Um, they were either sort of sexy, glamorous people, or they were people who had sort of um, stylish and, and, you know, jobs that one would aspire to. I can remember as a child adverts for Rothmans, which always had the sort of, you could see from the cuff of the jacket reaching out for the cigarettes that it was belonged to a kind of naval commander or a pilot or something. Um, so he made these paintings, and you'll see, when I send you the PDF of the book, you'll see some of them are enormous. There's a work in the take called Gift Wrap, which has sort of packed box-like forms reaching out into the space. So it's about, you know, four foot deep, but it's about 15 foot across. An enormous painting. So incredibly ambitious um, and very, very sort of radical in that way that, that he broke, you know, the idea of what painting could be. And from those, he made a whole series of works which, where the canvas is still hung on the wall, but sort of reached out, they kind of bend over, these sort of um, strangely shaped canvases curve out from the wall, um, as I say, becoming almost like sculpture. Um, but he found that they became incredibly unwieldy and they needed such complex wooden structures, which, he, which were built actually by a guy from Bath for him, that um, he stopped doing that and moved to this sort of new lightweight and the lightness and the airiness became a key part of his work um, in this series of kites. I mean, really literally in the shuttle where it sort of hangs from the ceiling and moves. We discovered when we were installing, if you open the side door, all the canvases sort of line up in a row, which I'm not sure they're supposed to do. Um, and um, you'll see in the book that one of the essays uh, by one of the other authors, Alex Masuris, talks about Smith's interest in air and flight. Um, and there is, you know, there is a kind of, a deliberate lightness about these works. There's also a kind of deliberate um, lightness of touch, if you like. I mean, I was talking about his early work um, deliberately engaging with kind of lower brow popular culture. But similarly here, these works are deliberately kind of casual and unfinished. So what he does is instead of stretching the canvas over a wooden structure, he, um, he stretches the canvas using kind of aluminium rods and string, like you would a homemade kite. Um, and that process, that structure is very deliberately left evident. So when you look at these, you'll see 
the rods are on the surface. You can see the way the string ties the canvas to the rods. And then you can see how he lets strings just hang off. So it's all very casual and relaxed. And I think, you know, there's something about the way the, everything sort of hangs loose, which I sort of think back to, I don't know, kind of late 60s, early 70s popular culture. You think about those kind of suede jackets with tassels that hung off them when you went to Woodstock or the Isle of Wight Festival in 1969. Um, and I think there is a bit of that um, in this work. And it's sort of interesting to think about how that might affect how we think about the, the work and the show. And now as I'm speaking, I think maybe we should have some music here because I think you see abstract art in a big white gallery and it has a certain kind of seriousness. But I think if you had a soundtrack of, um, I don't know, 60s music or 70s rock and roll, it would feel very different. And I think that, you know, part of what Smith was doing, though it's now 50 years old, was trying to get painting to kind of let its hair down in that way um, and, and you know, relate more to, to a kind of wider culture and get it out of the gallery or the high brow idea of what art could be. And he sort of succeeded actually because these works naturally suited themselves to kind of public commissions. So particularly in America where you get these huge public spaces, um, he had a whole series of important commissions from uh, in various air, ports in America or shopping malls. Um, Mr. Chow's restaurant in London and then in Los Angeles um, commissioned um, hanging kites from Smith. And most famously, if any of you have been there, if you go to the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London, uh, there's a work from the 1980s by him that hangs in the sort of, I think, in the central atrium space, um, really sort of filling the whole sort of volume of that multi-story um, space. So, you know, Smith was a really major figure as I said, he had a show at the Whitechapel very early in his career. He represented Britain in, at the Venice Biennale twice, once in 1966 when they showed multiple artists, the four artists including Smith, and then in 1970 he was the first artist to have the whole of the British Pavilion at Venice um, dedicated to his work. So, you know, he was a really big name and as I say, to have a retrospective at the Tate Gallery um, at the age of 40 was pretty um, unprecedented has to be said at that point painting was going out of fashion art was becoming very conceptual and Smith sort of gradually also went out of fashion he continued working all the time um, and painting he spent a lot of the later 70s 80s and indeed the 90s sort of moving backwards and forwards from England to America um, and he ended up spending his last years in New York and then in um, Long Island um, he died in 2016 um, and he really only started being revived in the 1990s. There was a big show at the Barbican called uh, The 60s Art Scene in London, I think, 1994. Um, and that was the first time really for, you know, 15, almost 20 years that there'd been a some major focus on Smith's work and his, it, it revived his reputation. And there've been a number of shows since then, particularly of his early 60s works, those sort of, um, ab big abstract cigarette packet paintings. So it's really exciting to have the first major display of his kites in this country for, for decades here in Bath. Um, I say a major display, I mean, there are only five works here, but as you can see, they're quite big. So it feels like a really major um, exhibition of his work. And we're hoping that combined with the book that will come out in October and the various other shows in London and promotion around those, that this show will get a, you know, a significant profile and, and those people who want to see um, Smith's work will come and see it because it is really astonishing and, and no one will have seen these works, as I say, for nearly 50 years. Um, so that's a bit light in solid information, sorry. Slightly weird doing a monologue at the Matt's phone. Um, but as I say, I can share through Spencer, I'll share the, the, the PDF of the book if I ever get it, or my essay, so you can you know, look up more information about Smith. And are we going to look at individual works, Matt? Yeah. As we, um, I'm not sure I can say very much about in, the individual works, but I think it will be worth at least sort of homing in on each one yeah. for this film. Yeah. Great.
Um, I have to say, we're going to say a little bit about each work, but I have to say, I, I spent my career writing about abstract artists, but talking about individual abstract paintings is quite difficult. Um, but this is a work called Big X. There is another work called Big T, and I think the title comes from the sort of shape it makes on the, on the wall. And I think, you know, we learned this installing it, that um, there is something very interestingly relaxed about this work. As you can see, it's one sheet of canvas stretched on um, a number of aluminium poles and then painted. You'll see that when you come to the show that the stripes, the brown and red stripes, have been painted, so the paint sort of slopped over the aluminium rods. And the, the, there is string that passes down the full length of the rods, and that's what pulls the canvas tight. But it actually just hangs from that one brown rope, um, which is hooked onto, hung on a hook on the wall, and passes through two loops on the canvas. And it's simply just that. And then gravity determines where the canvas hangs. So it's a very, very kind of casual, concept of what a painting could be. And you can see the spare rope and strings just kind of um, cascade onto the f floor and sit as they fall. So it's very, you know, it's very much about, you know, letting painting be relaxed and informal, um, which of course traditionally it very much isn't in a sort of rectangular canvas set in a, a gilded frame, if you think about the picture gallery at the Holborn. So this painting is called Three Crosses. Um, it's, I think it's the same year or shortly after Big X and the shuttle. Um, you can see why, where it gets its title from. Um, some of the titles are a bit more evocative than that. Um, and again, you know, I just highlight the informality of this. The three canvases stretched across the aluminium rods. And then all three have a string which is hung off the same hook on the wall. So the three canvases are layered one on top of the other. But they find their position just through gravity. Um, and you can see also, if you look closely at this in the painting, that there's a great sort of informality. It's only two colours, and, and where the green cross and the, the sort of ochre background um, meet, the two colours kind of um, blend into each other. So they're not at all hard edged, it's very sort of fluid um, and leaky. And it's worth, I think, noting, I mean, less so in this than in others, that one of the characteristics of Smith's work is, you know, he has a beautiful kind of touch with the paint. He was known for his very sort of um, almost poetic kind of way of putting on paint. Um, uh, sort of vigorous diagonal marks often and a sort of gentle layering of different tones of colour. I mean, when you see um, the shuttle, which we'll look at in a minute, in the flesh, you'll see that the blue, it looks like great sheets of denim, but the blue is very sort of subtly modulated throughout. Um, and that's a really important part of the work, I think. You can feel the process of its making and its painting when you look at it. And the shuttle, obviously, is the star um, turn in this um, show. It's enormous. It's seven canvases. I think they're six foot six square, um, whatever that is, two meters and a bit square. Um, they have a sort of, I think, a prescribed distance apart. But again, each one hangs from a single string, so that determines their orientation. And you'll see there's a sort of, each one has one corner cut off with a slightly brighter blue band. And so you get a slight sense of the thing kind of turning through space, if you like, a bit like a corkscrew. Um, but um, as I was saying, it's worth seeing it close up and in the flesh, because you'll see that the, ca the painting of the canvas is much more subtle and modulated than, than you would realize from a photograph. Um, so, um, and of course, it is again, I mean, you can see this as an extension of those sort of layered canvases, like three crosses. But here the layers have been pulled apart, so they fill the room. Um, one of the interesting things about preparing this exhibition has been the sort of lack of a decent photograph of this work, because, you know, it's so big, it's not something you can just pull out of storage and photograph. So um, we've relied on an old photograph of it hanging in a warehouse. I know um, when Smith was preparing his 1975 Tate show. I don't think this work was reproduced, but the other huge work, Yellow Pages, he had to borrow um, the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford um, gallery for a weekend to get the work hung and photographed because it was the only space big enough for him to see it um, and to get the distance of, um, of it to be photographed. So it's really exciting seeing this work here um, like this. And again, you know, just to reiterate, you can see the sort of informality of the work, the way the strings 
hang down, the whole thing kind of hangs out, if you like, in a very casual way. So this work is called Double Figures. Um, it continues some of the ideas that we've already seen in the earlier works. This is from the early 1980s. Um, and what you see is four canvases um, in two pairs. Um, and a kind of um, suggestion, they're not identical, but they're sort of similar. You know, the, the green and red um, uh, angle piece over the sort of um, indigo and red larger piece um, underneath. And it's as if you're looking at one form that has sort of tumbled over the other way up. Again, they're hanging from single hooks and gravity is determining how they hang one over the other. But there is a suggestion of movement, which I think develops the idea that's in works like Shuttle, that there's a sort of, through the multiple canvases, you get a sense of a form that is twisting in space in Shuttle or, or rolling over, if you like, um, in double figures. So, um, yeah, there's an interest, I think, there in how you kind of create a sense of dynamism and movement through space um, with something static, with painting. This is Major Battle from 1984, and I think, I don't know why it's called that, um, but there's an interesting um, balance in this work or tension between a sort of a dynamic kind of movement and sort of rigid elements as well, visual elements. Um, so though it's made up of multiple canvases layered um, one over the next, um, you can see there are certain sort of unifying elements. So these sort of squares that run across the middle the top edge all line up and similarly along the bottom you can see some of the lines on different canvases line up so it's as if Smith is trying to taking these multiple elements which are all quite informal and loose you know they have that sort of hang loose feeling of all the other kites but then he's within that creating these sort of more fixed elements I wonder if the title major battle doesn't come from the sort of dynamic um, diagonal energy that it has and the way these um, canvases are hung diagonally and then are contrasting things. It makes me think of the great Battle of San Romano, San Romano in the National Gallery by Uccello, which is famous for the sort of the pile of lances on the, on the, in the foreground that give this sort of deep perspective as they all um, create perspectival lines. It sort of, it gives a sense of um, the violence of the battle through the use of diagonals in the painting. And I wonder if that maybe isn't in Smith's mind. I have to say, I don't know whether the title comes before the work or whether he titled them once he'd finished. I suspect the latter. So it might be that those forms suggested to him some sense of kind of the violence of battle. Um, but again, as I say, you know, you get that energy of the diagonal canvases, but then it's kind of suppressed by that sort of the underlying um, or overlying um, formality of, of, the, of the, the lines that line up from one canvas to the next.